So our next speaker, he might be a star in the FreeBSD world. So uh, he actually wrote a few books about ZFS. And uh, today he's going to present about uh, a new encryption algorithm, sorry, a new compression algorithm, which has been brought to uh, ZFS on FreeBSD. So please welcome Alan Jude. OK. Hi, so uh, my name is Alan Jude, and I'm a FreeBSD committer, and uh, I co-authored FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and Advanced ZFS with Michael Lucas, uh, and I run a video streaming company in my day job. Uh, so the compression algorithm is called Z Standard. It was designed by Jan Collette, who wrote LZ4, which we use heavily in ZFS today, uh, at Facebook. Uh, the general concept is to get compression ratios closer to what you get with GZIP, uh, but faster. Because uh, LZ4, you get less compression, but more speed. Uh, it's actually a combination of a number of different compression algorithms, including a finite state entropy encoder and a Huffman encoder. And like how GZIP has its nine levels, uh, currently there are 22 and soon to be more levels in Z standard. And it provides you a much greater array of uh, speed and memory trade off. Uh, and then there's also a dictionary training feature, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so just quickly comparing Z standard to Zlib, which is GZIP, and LZ4, you can see instead of about a 2 to 1 compression ratio, you can get closer to 3 to 1, uh, but it's not as fast as LZ4, but four times faster than GZIP. And these numbers are per core, so if you have a, a reasonable number of cores, then you're going to be much faster than your spindles or maybe even your SSDs, and so the trade-off for having the compression is pretty low. Uh, so, uh, I originally started working on this when uh, Z standard 1.0 came out in uh, the middle of 2016. Uh, the very beginning of it was quite easy. Uh, ZFS has a nice clean API. You just add some functions to a table, and it, you know it's like here's the buffer I want to compress. Here's the buffer I want you to write the compressed version into, the sizes and whatever, and it was very straightforward to do. Um, this is made easier because in the design of Z standard, they actually provide a way for you to specify your own memory allocator instead of it using malloc and free. Uh, so it was easy to adapt that to say, well, here, hook up to the FreeBSD kernel memory allocator. Um, although in the 1.0 version of Z standard, they also used a lot of stack space, which caused all kinds of grief. <laughs> but luckily, in, in later versions, they uh, offered a, a heap mode much like uh, LZ4 has, that meant we could just alloc the memory that way. Uh, so the code review for this in FreeBSD, including support for booting, uh, like in the bootloader for booting from a Z standard compressed disk, is currently up for code review. And once it goes in FreeBSD, uh, we'll post a, a PR up to uh, the OpenZFS repo. Uh, so the approach we used to integrate Z standard into FreeBSD uh, was uh, we basically imported a copy of Z standard into contrib Z standard. Um, it's already been updated a couple times. I think when we imported it, it was 1.1, and now we're up to 1.3. Uh, and then in the FreeBSD base system, we actually install libz standard, although we install it as what in FreeBSD we call a private library, meaning it's um, namespaced off so that only applications that are part of FreeBSD use it, whereas third-party packages that users install won't be able to find this, and if something depends on Z standard or they want to install Z standard, they get the version of the library from ports. And this way, if there's an older version built into FreeBSD, they can install a newer version from packages and it won't conflict. Uh, so once that was already there, I just made our, the ZFS kernel module on FreeBSD link against uh, that library, or rather pull in certain files, uh, share the code, uh, and it worked. Uh, and then I integrated it into our lib standalone, uh, which is what's used by our bootloader, so that you can do Z standard decompression in the FreeBSD bootloader. Uh, still work in progress is actually being able to support uh, memory file system images where you actually have the kernel and so on compressed with Z standard and being able to decompress that and you know pixie boot with a compressed kernel uh, and so on. 
Uh, so there was a few other challenges with memory. Um, unlike LZ4, which has a fixed uh, context size for compression and decompression, uh, it's slightly tunable in LZ4, but the, the one we we're using in, in ZFS is just a fixed 16 kilobyte memory allocation. So there's one KMEM cache. Uh, with Z standard, with the different levels uh, and different record sizes, you get different context sizes for the compression and decompression. Uh, so I actually, the approach I took so far is to create an array of uh, KMEM caches uh, based on the, I picked three of the uh, compression levels, uh, the minimum, the default, and the maximum, uh, instead of implementing all of them because there's uh, only so many uh, spots in the enum on the on-disk format for the compression uh, types. And it turns out we don't actually want to put all of them in there anyway. Uh, so a decompression context with LZ or with uh, Z standard is 150 kilobytes. And then compression varies uh, with a 16K record. Uh, with the minimum compression level, the, the context is 136K. And then if you use 8 meg blocks with the dash 19, you can get up to a 50 meg context to compress. It usually won't use that amount of memory, but that's the worst case scenario. Uh, so we have an array of the compression levels and the record sizes, and we use the, a function in Z standard that estimates the context size, and we create uh, a bunch of KMEM caches that we would use. And initializing those doesn't really have a cost, and then they only get used if you actually start using something that block size and that compression level. Uh, so no, those 50 megabyte <laughs> KMEM caches won't actually take up any memory unless you actually start compressing 8 meg blocks of data. There's, uh, in the newer version, there's a new API uh, init standard, uh, static context uh, where you can actually provide your own memory instead of it dynamically allocating from the KMEM cache. Um, but we'd need like a pool of pre-allocated things per thread and we don't want to do that with 50 megabyte contexts. So currently the KMEM cache is what I've stuck with. Uh, so this has led to the question of, because there are 19 or 22 of you, uh, if def in the ultra mode in Z standard levels, in the on-disk format, we only need to know that it's Z standard, so when we go to decompress it, we can use that decompressor. We don't actually need to know which of the 22 levels was used to compress it in order to decompress it. So ideally, Z standard would only take up one slot in the enum, and then maybe we'd have a, a new property called compress level that would control what level we compress it with per data set. Uh, but I'm having trouble reasoning about how to handle that when, you know, if you set the compressed level for Z standard to 10, and then you switch to gzip, 10 isn't a valid compression level. And same with LZ4, which doesn't really have compression levels, although there, it has something we could use like a compression level. But uh, I don't know how to have a property that's very tightly coupled with another property where, you know, if you change from Z standard to LZ4, suddenly you have uh, this compressed level property that doesn't make any sense. Or going the other way, the compressed level, what, when we create this new property, what do we set it to by default for LZ4? Uh, and so on. Uh, so for now, instead of filling up the enum, I just created the minimum, the default, and the maximum compression level uh, in the prototype. Uh, so I did a little benchmark here of compressing the Silesia compression corpus, the standard benchmark for compression. Uh, with the minimum level, you compress about 335 megs a second uh, per core with a compression ratio of 2.8 to 1. The default gives you 3.16 to 1, and the maximum level, uh, without engaging the ultra mode, uh, gives you almost 4 to 1 compression, but is only at 3.3 megabytes per second per core which might be a bit slow. <laughs> uh, although looking at gzip, uh, the minimum on gzip, you only get 2.7 to 1 compression at 77 megabytes a second. Uh, at about that same speed, you could get 3.4 to 1 compression with Z standard. And with uh, gzip-9, uh, you're barely getting the compression level that Z standard would get at 20 times the compression rate. So you can get a lot more throughput. 
Uh, so then I did a more real world benchmark of an install of FreeBSD, including all of the source code, uh, splatted down onto data sets with the various compression and block sizes. And you see the three at the bottom there are LZ4, where you get a little better than two to one compression. Uh, the first dot is the, the base system with all the binaries, the middle one's the source code, and the other one's the total. Uh, and then you can see the blue ones at the top are the maximum compression with, as a standard, you can get over four to one compression on the base system. Uh, combine that with compressed arc, and you're getting a much better cache hit ratio. Uh, so earlier, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Paris for EuroBSDCon, uh, and was talking to one of the vendors that was there, and they run a payment processor in Europe. It's mostly an append-only database, but uh, I was helping them debug some performance problems they're having, and I first thing I noticed is for their MySQL database, they were using 128K record size. I assumed it was because they didn't know better, but when we discussed it with them, it's actually they do it on purpose because they get a better compression ratio, and they have 20 ter or 25 terabyte database that has to fit all on SSDs, and they can only afford so many SSDs. And since it's mostly an append-only database, it's not, uh, they don't get as much write amplification as you would with random access. But they're using uh, the larger record size because it got them an extra of like 0.5 to 1 on the compression ratio. So obviously, uh, uh, stronger compression that would still be fast enough might be quite interesting to them. So I grabbed uh, a database that we have at work, which is uh, our ticketing database for a pay-per-view system. It's about 14.2 gigabytes. Uh, with LZ4, uh, we get about 3.8 to 1 compression. Uh, with the regular 16K blocks we actually use in the database. But if we scale that up to 1 meg blocks in the database, we actually get 5.4 to 1 even with just LZ4. Uh, and writing that data takes about 50 seconds to write out the 14 gigs and have it be compressed. Uh, with GZIP, uh, you get even better compression uh, between 5 and 8 to 1, depending on the block size. Uh, but it takes about twice as long to write out the data. Uh, with Zed Standard, on the minimum compression level, uh, you get between 5.5 and, and up to 9 to 1 compression, and it actually takes less time than LZ4 because while it's using more CPU time, you're writing less data, and so it, it completes faster. Uh, and then the default level with Zed Standard we saw almost 10 to 1 compression, and with the maximum, we actually got 12 to 1 compression, but it took 15 minutes to write out the 14 gigs of data. <laughs> so, but that's only on a four-core machine. If, if you had more processors, you can get the work done faster. But you know, the, the max level one probably only makes sense in the archival type uh, workload. Uh, one of the other interesting features I touched on, uh, Part of the reason why Facebook is so interested in Z standard is it has this custom dictionary training compression mode. Uh, their main goal with it is someday that browsers will support Z standard, and they'll be able to send their you know ten JSON messages that are based on the same dictionary but with different content, compressed with this custom compression dictionary that will be able to abstract out the the repeated parts of the structure of the data. Um, and so while I was digging through the ZFS code, I came across this little comment in one section. It's like, XXX, we should have a custom compression algorithm for arrays of block pointers. I'm like, I wonder if this would work for that. Uh, and Matt had some ideas on that uh, when he was reviewing these slides. Uh, uh, if we wanted to actually offer this to end users to be able to say, here's a dictionary or some dictionaries for the types of files I'm going to write into this data set, what would the ZFS API for the user to load that dictionary into ZFS look like, and how would we manage them? I, I don't know what that would look like. Uh, and so looking back at the, the customer with the database and using the larger record size and, and other discussions I've seen similar to that uh, raises the question, would it be practical to have uh, instead of the record size we have now, which is the logical, the actual amount of data, and then we compress it and write a lesser physical amount to actually try to keep filling the record until the physical size is the 128K block or whatever. Uh, and Matt and I briefly had a chance to discuss where that might be practical and where it might not, but I don't know what the ZFS API would look like for being able to continue to keep feeding data until you've actually filled up uh, a physical record of some reasonable size. 
but how much waste might that save? You know, if you're using 8K records in Postgres and getting four to one compression on them, uh, you know, how much slack are you leaving uh, on the hard drive because the SSD uses 4K or 8K sectors? Uh, another interesting thing that Zez Sander has recently grown uh, as a <coughs> contributed project is an adaptive compression feature. Uh, kind of designed before we had uh, compress, send, and receive, where people would pipe ZFS send into gzip or multi-threaded gzip or whatever. Um, this Z standard one will actually dynamically adjust the compression level based on how fast the output is being consumed. So if you're going over a slow network link, it will spend more time compressing, but only up to the point where it's not starving the network link. So it's saturating the network link and doing as much compression as it can. But if your network is faster, it won't waste time compressing and actually end up slowing down the process. So it dynamically adjusts the compression level to keep up with the how fast you can drain the output buffers. That might be very interesting in ZFS, uh, where it's like, compress it as good as we can without slowing down our writes to the disk. Although in ZFS, we're writing records that are you know, even in the worst or best case are only 16 megabytes, or in most cases are 128K or 16K, you don't have much time to adapt in that, in that kind of context. But I know uh, at Nexenta they have previously talked about a smart compression feature where you're writing to a large file and kind of keeps a history of how well of other blocks in this file compressed, uh, and that might be able to be, do some kind of adaptive training to select the right compression level to get the best compression uh, without actually slowing down what you, how fast you're writing to disk. Uh, I've also been in contact with the author, uh, Jan Collette, and he's very interested in Z, Z Center being used in ZFS and so on, and has offered to help uh, by adding new APIs to Z Standard that if they would make it easier to integrate things with ZFS. Uh, so if you have any ideas of what that might look like or what extra features you would like from a compressor in order to make it more integrated uh, or more useful in ZFS, like uh, LZ4 has got some interesting features for that early abort where it will uh, decide that it can't compress it into that small of a buffer uh, and will not waste a bunch of time trying to compress it. Uh, so maybe something like that would also be nice. Uh, Z standard also has both a block compression and a streaming compression API. There might be some use for that. Uh, what would be nice is to talk to them about if there's things we could do to reduce the amount of memory it takes when we're trying to only compress like 8K blocks. We really don't want to have to allocate 100 kilobytes of, of RAM for the context for that. And you know, if, if the largest record we're ever going to have is 8 or 16 megabytes, maybe the decompression context could also be smaller. And more tuning options like that. But also maybe a Z standard API that actually understands ABD or just scatter gather lists, uh, meaning that we don't have to make a contiguous buffer before we feed it to the compressor. Uh, if, if Z standard's API could actually consume the ADB scatter gather list, uh, you know, we could save a whole B copy or something. Uh, and even just that might be a valuable performance increase. Uh, so I have a couple more slides that are mostly just about the history of my little project, but I don't think we have time for that. <laughs>